we have been overwhelmed by your response. Many people have posed the optical question direct to my team and I. They know what we do for them. But what can active leaders in optics and photonics do for us? The answer is simple. By joining Optica as a corporate member, you encourage us to expand our trusted global network and support our new range of services. Get deep insights into what's next for your sector in photonics with free access to over 90 market reports, plus exclusive access to the PowerPoint slides for the in-person meetings. And corporate members get exclusive access to all Optica industry meetings in 2024, including our executive forum during OFC, the Freeform Optics Industry Summit in Rochester, New York, hosted by Optimax, the Advanced Manufacturing Industry Summit at SUS Microoptics. If you are an investor in photonics, you'll recognize where I am now. Hello from Frankfurt Messe, which will be the venue for the ECO Conference 2024. The third Tech Summit in Silicon Valley. The Optica Laser Congress in Osaka, Japan. Plus the Optica Quantum Industry Summit, this time in Bristol, UK. And remember, being a corporate member of Optica also gives you discounted access to many partner events such as Peak Summit Europe, Driving Vision News and Peak International. Not over meeting of Christmas. Join us on February 27th for the next Optica Online Industry Meeting. Give us 120 minutes and we will give you insights into realistic business opportunities in the world of new space. During the last Cold War, space agencies in the US and Russia were handed blank checks. But today, new space relies on global market economies to deliver breakthroughs at a fraction of those historic costs. SpaceX, Starlink, Project Cooper dominate the headlines. But other players like India, Japan, Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates are now entering the new race for new space. We will hear from several specialists about how agencies like TLR are working with industry partners like TESAT to take CubeSats to a new level. The major advantage of the new space move, and especially for the CubeSats, is that you have a um, very easy and fast access to space, which gives you the possibility that you can demonstrate your technology in the final environment. And uh, therefore, uh, CubeSats are mainly used as precursor missions to demonstrate single technologies for larger missions. Larger missions are usually still used in the classical space with larger satellites, but they need a very long development time. Swarms are the drones of, of space, really, and with CubeSats, they are so miniaturized uh, that we have the opportunity to now experiment with swarms in space and actually demonstrate new sensing techniques which couldn't be achieved with single large monolithic spacecraft. Technologies that we expect to be used in CubeSats a lot is uh, photonic integrated circuits. We will also get an update from Bob Bramley, CEO of Laser Light Communications. How will lasers revolutionize global communication networks by integrating satellite and ground-based networks? And how soon will this be commercially viable? Our agenda also includes short contributions from active Optica corporate members, including Alpao, 
Gentech EO, K-Labs, Guchan Housego, Optimax, PLX, Demcom, Scanway, and Aspherikon. And I'm sure Mark Lukovic of Five Reality will add interesting thoughts to this conversation. So that's our new Optica Online Space Industry Meeting. So the future calls, how will you answer? Thank you very much, everyone, for joining this very important online industry event. I cannot describe with words what I'm feeling right now. My team and I, Olga Ras, Elise Fritz-Gates, Helena Diaz, you have worked really hard to have you here today. And the goal for the next two hours is that you connect with each other and we find out the upcoming trends for what we call new space. Until now, space has been a technology for prototypes and small volume production. We have seen a game changer. And all of us are going to investigate it for the next 115 minutes. Let's understand a little bit what this meeting is about. Many of you, for many of you, this is not the first time you come for an online industry meeting, but I would like to tell you that I am here representing a very large organization. I'm here representing Optica, the former OSA. And within Optica, we have the corporate engagement department connecting with the industry. We are providing you with market reports. We have I think the best industry events in the world, but who am I to judge? But we also provide you with a network of persons who want to connect with you, investors, partners, suppliers, and customers. Let's investigate if we can do that in the next two hours. I am here talking on behalf of the president of Optica 2024, Gerd Lex from Max Planck Institute, and the Corporate Engagement Council. These are the people who tell us what to do and how to do it. If we do it wrong, they are the ones to blame. I would like to let you know also that we have a long range of events online and face-to-face. -face. You can see them at Optica Industry website, but also uh, today is new space. In a few weeks, 19th of March, laser micromachining. Please, if you, have, if you are manufacturing laser optics or any kind of laser system for the next generation material processing, you should be there. That's going to be also a spectacular. But today, it's all about new space. And as you saw with these kind of events, we have two types of companies here. The companies who we call integrators and adopters who are coming here to tell us what they need. That is today's ISA, DLR, Comstar Space Communications, and Aurora Tech. And then we have the companies, all of you, who are here to supply solutions for those needs. These are Gentech, EO, Hushan House, Goalpa, OHF, PLX, Dencon, Fire Reality, Scanway, Aspherikon, and K-Labs. But however, these are only the people who told us that they want to show one slide. These are the companies that registered for the meeting today. Olga Ras, director of Optics at Optica, has done a great job understanding each company individually and setting up this supply chain. This is all our opinion, the puzzle that all of you the 300 companies are registered for the meeting today, all of you can work together. We will publish this slide. Of course, no supply chain is 100% correct, but we do our best to classify it in the best way that we can. We will publish this in LinkedIn, in our newsletter. We want everyone to know that all of you registered for this meeting, and this is, in our opinion, in the opinion of Optica staff, the piece of the puzzle that you cover. And with this, I also would like to tell you that, you remember, we had the optical.org dash market reports. Please go there regularly. I just published a report of all the displays last night. Go there and download all the reports that we have there. We purchased this report for, from commercially available market analysts. Please make sure you use them. All corporate members have free access to all the market reports. And last but not least, I would like to let you know that this meeting, I hope you're looking your best. I didn't in the meeting room and remember the meeting will stay in youtube afterwards and let's start the meeting let's start the meeting and today to start a meeting like this i would like to remind everyone that uh, optica is global optica is global and i'm a person who has a very close connection to the european space agency to start a meeting like this i would like to give the floor they would like to go to Nordbike, to the European Space Agency, and ask them today to start the meeting the way that we deserve. Roger, thank you so much for taking the role of opening the online industry meeting on New Space. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Isa.
Yes, so good, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Roger Walker. I'm head of the CubeSat Systems Unit um, at European Space Agency at STEC in Noordwijk in the Netherlands. Um, I work in the Directorate of Technology, Engineering and Quality. And uh, this afternoon, I'm going to give you a short overview of our in-orbit demonstration CubeSat missions, really with a focus uh, for this Optica event on missions that we are uh, doing for demonstration of new compact optical payload technologies. Um, we've been supporting uh, the CubeSat sector, the industry sector in Europe for more than 10 years in our technology program. Uh, we have had a number of uh, CubeSats launched in the past, nine of them have been launched, and we have another, uh, well, more than 10 in design and development currently. And this is really to uh, support the industry, first of all, to develop their technology, but also to test it in space at low cost, but with also a, a rapid schedule compared to um, conventional space projects. So this is, uh, as was seen in the video previously, the main advantage of uh, using CubeSats for technology demonstration. But we also try to do missions which are proof of concept missions. So not only demonstrating technology, but demonstrating the first application of the technology towards users. Uh, you can see here the uh, chart which is summarizing uh, all of the CubeSat missions we've either launched or are implementing currently. Um, the ones circled in red have optical payloads on board. So that's more than half of the missions uh, in our portfolio with, with payloads uh, concerning, uh, concerning compact optics. Um, there's also recently uh, our incubed program, uh, which is dedicated to commercial Earth observation uh, business case demonstrations, where we have another two missions which we're managing on behalf of, of that program, particularly for, um, as I said, commercial Earth ob observation in the um, uh, visual uh, optical domain, but also thermal infrared. So. I'll just give you a quick overview of each of the ones, uh, the main missions, uh, which are circled there in red. Uh, first of all was GOMEX-4, and that was uh, launched in 2018, uh, a six-unit CubeSat. That was notable by the fact that it was the first uh, hyperspectral imager to be demonstrated and flown on a CubeSat platform. You can see the imager here developed by Cosine in the Netherlands. Uh, that was a successful mission and it um, it basically unveiled for the first time the possibility for small platforms to generate hyperspectral imagery for, for instance, vegetation uh, monitoring at low cost. Uh, Cosine went on, of course, to sell quite a number of those um, hyperspectral cameras after that. Um, more recently, we had the launch of the Mantis CubeSat from the Incubed program that was developed by Open Cosmos in the UK uh, with a payload, uh, double Cassegrain telescope payload developed by Satlantis in Spain. It's providing now on orbit during the commissioning um, super resolution images of a resolution around 2.5 meters uh, with a geolocation knowledge of better than 100 meters. So that's currently ongoing. 12 units CubeSat. Um, also coming up for launch this year is the Forest 3 CubeSat with Aurora Tech in Germany. Uh, that's for wildfire detection. It's demonstrating their platform and payload uh, as an eight unit CubeSat for wildfire detection and providing a low latency uh, alert of detected wildfires for their proprietary uh, wildfire system uh, service for uh, fighting fires, of course, when they occur on ground. So that's due for launch this year. Uh, in design at the moment, we have a mission called Volcane, which is uh, two 12 unit CubeSats uh, to be launched in um, a low orbit, actually with uh, electric propulsion to perform formation flying. And both of those CubeSats will be carrying thermal infrared cameras and providing stereoscopic imaging in the thermal infrared of, um, of volcanic activity on the ground. So that's coming up for, uh, for launch uh, later on in uh, 2026. Uh, so those are the ones that are really focused on Earth observation and use cases, but we have also one called CubeSpec, 
um, in development for astronomy. Uh, that's a six unit CubeSat by uh, University of Leuven uh, led project. And uh, that's for providing high spectral, um, high, high spectral resolution uh, spectrometry of bright stars. Um, basically that's going to be uh, providing measurements with a time series of uh, spectrum of uh, asteroid astero seismology um, phenomena in bright pulsating stars that's due for launch ne uh, next year and the uh, the challenging part of this is not only the, the optical payload but also embedding um, line of sight stabilization uh, techniques inside the payload in order to achieve an arc second level uh, three axis pointing for long duration uh, acquisitions of the of the stellar uh, spectra so that's an active tip tilt uh, mirror inside the the optical payload to um, to get very highly stable uh, measurements then we move on to deep space uh, that's very exciting uh, we have uh, coming up for launch later this year our HERA mission, that's a planetary defense mission. Uh, it's a large spacecraft of around one ton uh, going to the um, Didymos asteroid, which has been previously uh, impacted by the NASA DART spacecraft. So HERA will arrive in um, 2027 to perform follow-up observations of the impact. And it will carry two CubeSats on board and deploy those CubeSats at the asteroid. Um, at actually the, the moon of the asteroid, which is called Dimorphos. One of those CubeSats is called Melani, uh, developed by Tyvac International in Italy. And that's carrying on board a payload, which is a hyperspectral imager by VTT in Finland. You can see some pictures of the, the flight model of the spacecraft here. And that's going to be uh, taking measurements of the surface composition of the asteroid. Uh, then we move on to the moon. So we have a project called Lumio uh, that's currently gone past the preliminary design phase now. That's a lunar CubeSat mission, again, a 12 units CubeSat platform. Uh, it will be going to um, the far side of the moon. So what's called a, a halo orbit in the Earth moon Lagrange point number two. So it's a, uh, an orbit which basically has a permanent visibility of the far side of the moon. And when the far side is in um, darkness, we'll actually be performing high frame rate observations with an optical camera uh, to detect impact flashes from meteoroids impacting the surface of the lunar far side. And this is very relevant for science in terms of uh, improving meteoroid models, also hazards on the surface of the moon when uh, in the future astronauts would go there and conduct surface operations. So that's uh, due for launch in the 2027 timeframe. Then we have uh, uh, probably our most ambitious mission, I would say. It's uh, a CubeSat which should uh, is being designed independently to rendezvous with a near-Earth asteroid and uh, characterize its physical properties. So it's a mission called Margo, uh, basically which would take a piggyback launch uh, out towards deep space and use use electric propulsion to transfer to rendezvous with the asteroid and spend six months at the asteroid. It will be carrying a hyperspectral imager, which you can see here in the slide, um, with four telescopes uh, on board, yeah, taking um, spectra, spectral imaging in the VIS near infrared and uh, short wave infrared wavelengths. And that will be for determining, as I said, uh, physical properties for the presence of in situ resources on the surface of the asteroid, which could be later mined in the, in the, in the distant future. Uh, but this is a mission really, which we call a breakthrough mission, which should lower the entry level cost of, of deep space exploration by more than, more than a factor of 10, and potentially then lead on to fleets of these uh, deep space CubeSats to address different applications like um, diversity in the asteroid population, uh, resources, as I said, but also as a fast reconnaissance capability for planetary defense. So that's just a real flavor of uh, what we're doing at ESA for small CubeSat missions demonstrating technologies with optical payloads.
Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That was an amazing um, overview of everything what you do. And not only, uh, let's say, for the missions, you know that everyone heard already, but really with the uh, deep space and also lunar missions. You've mentioned some of the challenges, you know, that uh, that um, you see in the development of the CubeSats. Could you repostulate them? Like, what are the technologies where ESA would appreciate Maybe help. Maybe uh, someone of our members can, or our participants can suggest an, an idea how to improve it or make it happen. Yeah, so there are a number of challenges, really. I think uh, it's obtaining, uh, from the point of view of optical payloads and the, the level of miniaturization, but also the, uh, the performances with those miniaturized systems. So being able to um, take spectral measurements but but also of a sufficient quality optical quality which would be relevant for users um they're also uh, going along with that a lot of these optical payloads produce a significant amount of data on board so there's a large scope to do an onboard processing of that data before it's downlinked to earth um, particularly with small platforms like cubesats where the uh, communications capabilities are quite constrained and the data rates are quite relatively low let's say although we're working on communication systems which are improving that and also looking at um, laser communication terminals which would be of interest to improve communications bandwidth we also want to have onboard data processing of payload data also including artificial intelligence as well which would help to really siphon out and, and pull out the most interesting um, aspects for for end users not only that but we have to point payloads correctly if i may yes. uh, so the, <laughs> the uh the attitude control of the satellites uh, the spacecraft are very important and that's uh, uh, a big challenge for cubesats to be able to point accurately enough for, for the optical payloads and there we do need uh, to develop further capabilities for star trackers for instance optical cameras which are uh, tracking stars and determining the orientation of the of the spacecraft accurately. Thank you very much. And do you know that because there was another question that actually I believe DLR might address later, but since it popped up already in the questions and answers, and uh, the question is, of course, because when we speak of the miniaturization, photonic integrated circuits are something that comes to mind directly, right? Because they're compact, they can save a lot of space and weight and increase, improve the form factors. And so the question from the audience, from the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, uh, I know there you have probably many Greek colleagues in ESA. Are there any peaks currently flying already on the orbit? Uh, not that I know of uh, currently. There might be in, in laser optical uh, communications terminals coming up in development. I think, certainly think our colleagues in DLR, Benjamin and colleagues, could tell us more about that. Um, but this is certainly, I think, uh, from what we see, um, a big growth area for innovation, certainly. For, uh, pit, uh, PIC circuits, photonic integrated circuits are a bit like the software defined radios of, of, of RF systems, really. Uh, they could really b open up a lot of flexibility in, um, in optical payloads and uh, laser systems for miniaturized uh, spacecraft, definitely. Mm. And uh, we have another question coming from IMAC, uh, from Suraf Kumar. Um, Suraf, could you please uh, then um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Suraf? Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, I had a question related to the cameras that you showed, the spectral cameras being installed. So currently from IMEC, for instance, we are developing uh, on-chip spectral images for hyperspectral and multi-spectral wavelengths. And I was wondering if you see any challenges when you go with that kind of sensors compared to the pre-existing ones like grating-based uh, sensors being implemented in the camera. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question. So um, the actually the payload which is using IMEC uh, Mosaic filters uh, is the one for the Margo mission, which I, ha I highlighted there. 
Um, that's looking at, um, as I said, mosaic filters overlaid on top of the sensor um, for hyperspectral imaging. Um, but of course, then we have to deal with the challenges of um, recombining the mosaic images uh, on board the camera to uh, to make full spectral um, imaging hypercubes without um, a significant loss in in um, in resolution, right? So um, that's what we're having to tackle right now is is that data recombination from the mosaic type filters. Uh, although it does provide us with a lot of advantages and allows us to miniaturize um, significantly the dimensions of the of the cameras. Um, yes, there there are other technologies we are looking into, like the Fabry Perot interferometer um, filters. That's um, going to be flying on the uh, Hera Milani CubeSat, which I mentioned there. So that will that will give us, with the variation of the band gap, the air gap in flight, the possibility to set the wavelength, the cent central wavelength of the images. So that's a different technology, of course, giving us full flexibility in flight um, compared to the to the mosaic uh, images. But we also have to see that that's operational for several years with a mechanism. Uh, with piezoelectric actuators so the actual piezoelectric actuator part there is quite tricky as well thank you for bringing up actually uh, piezo actuators and all the uh, com uh, components for the uh, space because of course uh, if we're talking about components for space applications they have to be uh, specifically certified for very harsh environments and we're actually one of our members which is uh, PLX they're active in this field and so I would like to ask Malcolm to um, unmute yourself and please present your solutions for the harsh environments of space Sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're PLX. Uh, we're a precision optics manufacturer. Um, our specialties are monolithic optical structures. So we are able to incorporate any optical element within a solid glass structure. Uh, the advantage this gives you is that it's extremely stable. We achieve arc second accuracy over hundreds of degrees of thermal variations and excursions. Uh, it's extremely robust to shock and vibration, and it holds its accuracy for very long periods of time. So you can see from the space timeline, we've been involved in a lot of space programs over the years. Um, a lot of these are retroflectors. Some of them are bore sighting systems. So, for example, we provide the alignment um, bore sight system for the ISAT-2. This allows the LiDAR laser and telescope to be optically co-aligned, corrected in situ, um, allows the, the, the system to achieve uh, that very high level of accuracy that you, lead, that you need. More recently, we're now combining active optical elements within our precision optical structures. So we're now incorporating beam steering devices, detectors, and all of that is part of our uh, precision beam steering solutions. So we're able to use this for tracking, for free space optical communications, navigation, those kind of applications. And again, we, we use the monolithic optical structure technology to achieve those very tight tolerances and accuracies. Um, so we go through the full design process, FEA analysis, uh, full qualification process. We're able to do all, all of the shock and vibe and thermal excursions in house and provide you with a fully space qualified product. Thank you, Malcolm. That's okay. Roger, any comment? Have you found? Have you seen an interesting component that you would think that might fly to the next mission? Yes, well, I was interested to hear about, of course, the tight tolerances and uh, the the, um, the beam steering, the active uh, beam steering techniques there. Yeah, and I do I do agree it is a, a, quite a challenge to qualify them for for use in space. It, it is, is yeah. possible, of course, and it brings great advantages for for accuracy, um, partic particularly I think to uh, let's say reject disturbances from. Uh, onboard micro vibrations on the spacecraft, as well as the jitter um, induced by the the attitude control system. So, um, 
yes, I've seen a few interesting things. There. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be in touch soon, I'm sure. Yeah, another in interesting, I think, um, presentation that is, is, of course, is also related to your comment about the uh, challenges of the optical payloads uh, is from uh, Scanaway and Oscar, who are, I believe you know one another because we've met at the same event. So I guess many familiar faces. Nevertheless, Oscar, please, it would be in a pleasure if you introduce the solutions of Scanaway for developing also optical payloads. Hello, everyone. Oscar Zunek from Scanway. I will. Mm -hmm. Do you see my screen? It's crystal clear. Perfect. OK, so we are Scanway Space. We are doing optical instruments for space, not only the telescopes, but also smaller cameras for many different applications, like uh, looking for, um, I would say, it depends on the needs, but uh, you can look on degradation on uh, photovoltaic arrays or for some in orbit servicing, manufacturing, and a lot of different applications with really small cameras. And uh, we can put it on the selfie stick and many different applications. Uh, it's also packed with AI for uh, doing everything uh, on orbit and send you on the information when there is some malfunction. And we're also doing the telescopes, telescopes uh, from small one like one unit telescope up to microsats. So a whole range of cubesats, I would say. Uh, maybe not one new, but yeah, the bigger one. Uh, Regarding spectral bands, it's uh, really different. We are right now going towards more short wave infrared as we see a lot of. Uh, a lot of our partners asking for shortwave infrared. Uh, we are um, define shortwave infrared from one thousand nanometers up to. It depends on the needs. I would say because we can use many different sensors. Uh, mm -hmm. In it depends on the use case. I would say because in some cases we are going up to one thousand sixty. 600 and sometimes we go in upper it depends i would say <laughs> what do you want to see uh and so yes we already have uh, some of our optics already on board uh on the satellites and it's already working in space um, our biggest telescope would be in space this year uh, with eagle eye mission probably in june or july and Yes, we are participating in many different projects. Also, I would like to mention LUVEX. LUVEX is the mission when we are shooting a laser into water. Uh, yeah, the goal is to do that on the moon uh, in some in about 10 years from now. But yeah, we're shooting for the uh, laser for the water right, to see the spectral um, how the water, if, if it's safe for uh, drinking of the astronauts. And also we are doing some other projects like the smaller one or the bigger one. Um, and that's mostly what we are doing. So the optics. Thank you, Oscar. Are there any questions? Because I don't see questions and answers, maybe from some one of the speakers. If speakers are interested, then please just oh. unmute yourself and ask your question. And if not, then I would like to, uh, to uh, because you've mentioned that, you know, with the optical payloads, one of the important ingredients is also, of course, the optical components themselves and pieces. And in this respect, I would like to introduce the HAF group and HAF Photonics and Louis-Marie Bra that are actually a quite notorious provider for advanced uh, uh, space optics pieces. Louis-Marie, could you please unmute yourself and uh, introduce your solutions? Yes, thank you, Holger. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes. So indeed, uh, thank you both uh, Scano and Ize for the, um, the context. And indeed, we find a lot of optical components in the payloads. So I'm going to briefly describe how we can help you on those points, which seems uh, critical because of the size of the um, of the CubeSats and also because of the precision that's needed to explore and uh, observe Earth and beyond. So our services go from um, the supply of the components themselves, 
which means uh, the polishing of the glasses or polishing of substrates, uh, which can be of uh, metal also. If you have also integrated uh, integrated optical parts uh, within the blocks, uh, we can polish them and um, in a second phase code them. So we go from um, the optics, the glass, the metal, to polish them and then we can cut them. And on top of that, if it's needed, depending on the application, we can also etch them. So to have patterns on it, this can be useful for the calibration of the focal planes or the resolution of the camera, depending on the, what you observe. And um, to comply with mass production also, mass production of space, at least, uh, we use fine dicing. So we have bigger series of small uh, components keeping the precision. So those are some examples of uh, the components we can have, uh, like prisms, of course, lenses and mirrors. Uh, it can go also thinner into wave plates uh, to have um, wavelength uh, separators. Um, for the coatings, we have obviously the interactive and uh, reflective coatings. We also use uh, PVD for dielectric coatings and uh, black coatings that can be also useful um, when they are qualified because all, all of our coatings are qualified for space applications. So um, uh, here is an example where you can see um, filters for hyperspectral uh, cameras, imagers. And we can also coat the um, optical fibers ends when they are encapsulated, encapsulated. So this is one of the specificities of what we can coat. And obviously, big, uh, bigger mirrors for the biggest payloads, but also it means coating many small mirrors. About the um, etching and lithography, uh, we have some in space already, some thousands, um, concerning the optical encoders. Uh, those are used for the, you probably know them for the positioning of the engines and the uh, directions of the satellites and the the um, the payloads. Um, and you can also have calibration targets uh, depending on the, the wavelengths you need, and it can be really specific. Um, with all those components, we can also assemble them. So it means we have capacities for molecular adhesion, uh, which is also qualified for space and gluing, but it's more, it's avoided when the uh, it goes into space. Um, and this goes all with the fine dicing. So everything that's processed before can be also diced into small parts. Here you have a scale of um, gold coated parts diced down. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are. I don't think I know more about that. Sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. Okay. And they are both used uh, with optical encoders for reflectivity um, positioning. And here are some examples of projects we've been working on in the space industry and in aerospace special with uh, defense. So we have calibration targets and uh, a lot of optical components in the, in the supercam of the Perseverant rover. Uh, we work also on Earth uh, ground stations, uh, as you see here with the CTA and the shark telescopes for the coding of the mirrors. And uh, of course, when we have a lot of small optical components, uh, they can go into uh, planes, airplanes, and the Rafale in this case, um, which is our expertise com comes from defense and we apply it in space with uh, also constrained environments.
Thank you very much, Louis-Marie, for this. It's great to have HEF in Optica. And here, Louis-Marie, there is something that we ask everyone. This is, what, this is our brand, right? This is our definition. We ask people the Optica question. This is what you can do for others, the other 600 corporate members of Optica, and what they can do for you. Louis-Marie, in the case of HEF Photo, it's a large company. What can we do for you? What can you do for us? Yes, sure. Thank you, uh, Jose. So the services we have here uh, can be applied I'm sure in the new space industry, the thing is um, we are working for partners in this industry to grow and uh, to develop this market. I'm sure Scanway, as you explained with your pilots, uh, we can work together and uh, You can work together with many of us. Let me give you an example. Yes. I'm going to introduce you to uh, a company that is leading the activities in Optica in in, uh, in optics. Um, and this company is coming all the way from France. And it's called Alpao. Julie Charton. Thank you very much for joining a meeting in space. You organize a meeting. Alpao has to be here. Uh, adaptive Thank optics. Alpao need to be here. Julien, what's on your mind? Yes, my question or do you want the full presentation? First question. Okay, so just I was interested by the dicing process uh, that you presented just before. What kind of material can you uh, can you process, and what kind of application is it for? Yes, thank you, Julien. So the dicing uh, we have it's with a diamond um, diamond dicing uh, wheel. We can dice them into really thin pieces and also have the rugosity of uh, down to three microns on the walls of uh, the dicing so it can be um, mm -hmm. the the gold coated um, sheet I show you goes into space also for um, reflections uh, mirrors for the encoders uh, more generally we use the dicing to have um, bigger quantities of small pieces so we dice down the glasses, the metals, the PMMA plastics uh, materials. Lubaki, you said three microns, and that's the what? What? It's, what is the three microns? Is the size of the defects on the facet, or what are? Yes, they? it's exactly this. Fantastic, Julian. Is that something you were waiting to hear? What is your demand when it comes to dicing? Ah, yeah, yes, maybe, maybe we, we we could be interested in this kind of very accurate dicing for for some uh, specific materials. The adaptive optics of all power here. And you have one, you have brought okay. one slide. Alpao is very engaged with Optica. Julian, come on, share your screen and let us know what you can do for others and what others can do for you. Oh, By the way, Adaptive cool. Optics are really, just yes, can I start sharing the screen. Adaptive Optics are really a much big demand right now in space communication, in free space optical networks. Julian, the floor and the attention for everyone goes to you. Yeah, thank you. Just once again, uh, check. Can you see my screen? Gorilla Glass Clear. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Julien Charton from Alpao, and I will uh, present you what we are doing. Our solution is about adaptive optics and deformable mirrors. So uh, what is a deformable mirror? You see a little picture here. It's a thin mirror, a real one, but that can move. And the purpose of this is to correct for the wavefront. Uh, to improve the signal quality or maybe to correct for other defects that are in a, in a system. So um, we already are involved in many uh, classical space projects. So for example, we are qualifying our deformable mirror technology for um, uh, Earth observation from space with an Airbus uh, company. Um, so the idea is to correct for all the little defects of the primary mirror of this large uh, space telescope, allowing to reduce the mass and cost of, the, of this mirror, uh, because we correct for any defect after. Uh, another example of application is a free space optical communication. So in this case, this is for communication between, between space and Earth, but the deformable mirror and the adaptive optic system in on, in the, on Earth and the ground. So the, the key is that you see when you send a, a, a laser communication um, from space to ground, you, you, you have the turbulence of the atmosphere and using adaptive optics, this is one solution to improve the signal to noise ratio and to improve uh, the quality of the communication. 
Uh, another example we are involved in, in the, we are working now with uh, with NASA. We have been uh, selected by NASA as one of the potential key supplier for the future habitable world observatory. So this will uh, be a huge uh, new space telescope, and the purpose is to make real images of uh, planets that could be habitable, that could have life on it. Uh, so all these projects are amazing. In this case. Uh, for NASA, we are the goal is to correct the wavefront to the, the level of a few picometers. So it's very challenging, but of course this is a very long project. So what we are looking here is to uh, to access to to we are looking for new space projects to speed up the TRL of uh, our technology. So we are not yet into space, but we are close. An example of project here is the Picture C balloon experiment. This is a telescope on a, at a 40 kilometer of altitude above ground. Uh, so it is uh, used for science to, to make coronographic image from, of uh, stars and planets. So this is an example. And really, uh, if you have a strong uh, science or business case where you and you think that um, adaptive optics could be useful in your project, just uh, just tell us. Oh, they can be useful in your projects. And go, allow me to go back to Poland. Allow me to go back to Skangway. Oscar, are you still there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So here, here we are. We are a Toptica network, and you play the role of a system integrator. I had Roger also from ISA with us. Roger, are you still with yeah. us? coming all the way from beautiful North Pike on the north of The Hague. So what we are going to do now, I need to understand from the two of you, from, from Oscar and from Roger, how can we work together? Oscar is representing Scanway, which is, at the end of the day, a company that works as a space OEM, puts photonics and optic technology all the way up there. Oscar, what are you looking for in this meeting? I think everything. We are not only we are not only doing the optics, the hardware, but we also helping in many different things. Also, the looking for right requirements depends what you need to see, and also we are helping with calibrating your optics, with teaching you how to use it always also in space because it's not so easy after all. You don't have out of focus on everything, so we are really open for everything, for helping, for teaching also people how to use optics and what they need it for. You are involved in many projects as a prime for ISA. Roger, uh, we have been discussing so far a lot about free, free space optical communications in satellites. Actually, two weeks ago at Photonics West, there were a presentation from SpaceX talking about thousands of lasers already operating in space for free space optical communications. In your vision, what role do uh, adaptive optics play in that particular need? Well, I think adaptive optics are very exciting uh, technology development that could be brought to space and used and exploited extensively, not only for uh, laser optical communication, as was mentioned there, but also for um, yeah the buildup of large space telescopes for Earth observation or astronomy. So, um, actually, we have uh, we are doing research and development here on uh, a mission concept. Uh, based on rendezvous and docking of several um, building blocks uh, based on CubeSat technology. Each building block would carry a mirror with uh, deformable optics. And you dock those together to form a large telescope then. And you have then the adaptive optics and control of the optics to focus the, uh, the optics and obtain the, the high quality uh, that you need. So it's a very interesting enabling technology, I would say. Um, Scanway, I would say, is also very interesting because they're doing small cameras for things like close inspection of uh, of debris or uh, for in-orbit servicing, let's say. I think from that point of view, the Scanway technology is also very interesting. Thank you very much, Roger. And when you do this coupling together, I think that's something that Julian is very excited, but also you can work with the most technology from Malcolm, from PLX. So all of you are gonna get back to it after this, but Julian, stay with me because there's a company in Optica that I want you to meet. This company is called OptoSense. Joey Costa, thank you very much for joining the meeting. This is a company providing engineering services for sensing in space. Joey, tell us what's on your mind. Uh, yes, Julian. Uh, hello. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, would you mind showing slide one one more time, please? Uh, yes, sure. Um... You can start phrasing the question, Joey. 
Yes, of course. So in your first slide, you demonstrated a uh, de right there. Yeah, the, the general concept of, you know, you, you, you deform a mirror, right? Yeah. And I, I hope it's not a question that's too far out. What is the maximum density you can do on your drivers? Uh, the drivers, so the actuator pitch, the typical size of every single actuator is 1 to 1.5 millimeter. So it means that uh, on a... Uh, 100 millimeter, you can put uh, thousands of uh, of single actuator, like like pixel of correction. Pixel, okay. Uh, I I hope I heard the right units. So, within 1.5 uh, millimeters. Yeah. 1.5 millimeters. That's the density. I see. Okay. So, uh, it, it, so in in a okay. So about in a centimeter, you got six by six, roughly, right? Roughly six by six. Okay. Yes. Typically. Um, and then now, let's say I have a very big optic. I don't know, 10 meters, okay? <laughs> big, big mirror, right? Uh, you wouldn't go to that density, would you? No, well, it's not impossible, but if you want to correct uh, for the optical aberration from a large mirror, usually you put the, a smaller deformable mirror in a plane that is optically conjugated with what you want to correct for, and this is much simpler. I see, understood. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, thank you, You're Joey, welcome. for being part of Optica, and thank you for bringing the engineering services on space, photonic sensing to us. Uh, Julien, so far you are rocking it, but there's going to be more questions coming to you in a little bit. Allow us to go to Germany now. Allow us to go to the German Aerospace Center. We are going to address now uh, another need from one of the giants in the space technology worldwide. Benjamin, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor and the attention for everyone goes to DLR. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jose, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invite. So um, my name is Benjamin Rüdiger. I'm uh, responsible for the technical development of the laser communication terminals, especially designed for CubeSats. We already heard a lot about hyperspectral cameras, high resolution cameras. And uh, Roger, thank you very much for mentioning the challenges. And I'm happy to show you our possible solutions, how we could overcome the challenges uh, radio frequency channels give us um, so far. So I do not want to um, dive, dive too deep into the advantages. Uh, so um, of course, the major advantages of very high data rates and the compact design um, are um, the main driver for laser communication. Um, and especially in, in this round here, I want to focus on our philosophy. And this is the modular design approach we follow from the first terminal on. And the first terminal especially designed for CubeSats um, is our base for all future developments. And you can see here on the right side already the development roadmap. So from our basic technology on the one hand to transfer the technology into other domains, into other use cases, uh, for classical communication. So when I talk about classical communication, I mean classical optical communication. And on the other hand, we have the transfer towards quantum key distribution as one of the next steps for uh, laser communication. So the base of our development, it's uh, Osiris for CubeSat. It was, um, and this is already a great example of a cooperation between research and industry. So um, the full development was done together with TSAT Spacecom, who financed the project of the development of a very compact laser communication terminal. And um, the outcome was Osiris for CubeSat, the so far world's smallest laser communication terminal with a data rate of 100 Mbit. Um, we already talked about the challenges of um, accurate pointing, so, um, and that's why Osiris for CubeSat is equipped with a fine pointing assembly, which can compensate inaccuracies, uh, inaccuracies of the satellite by up to plus minus one degree. And uh, with that, being able to steer the beam very, very accurate to the ground station that we can achieve the, uh, the high power density we need for the, um, for the high data rate. TZAT already took over this design, and you can see it on the on the right hand. So this is the first sold Cube LCT. So um, TZAT took over the full design 
um, without any change, which is for us as a research in institute, a big honor that they took over the full design without any change. And they have, have it now in their portfolio under the name Cube LCD. Part of the development was the demonstrator mission. And the uh, demonstrator mission, Pixel 1, started in January 21. And um, afterwards, we um, learned a lot about satellite attitude system and especially about Star Trekker, um, which took us roughly two years to stabilize the pointing. And it showed us that we are still highly depending on high accurate sensors on, um, on CubeSats. And it um, took us more or less two and a half years that in uh, June 23, we could for the first time establish an optical connection to our ground station, which you can see on the right. And this year, this is not a picture, this is a video of the laser coming from the, uh, from the satellite. And uh, that it's that stable. This is the major result of our terminal because this shows how accurate our control loop is and how stable the pointing works with our fine pointing assembly. The goal was to demonstrate this terminal in a quasi operational scenario. That's why we transmit a picture, but the picture itself, itself this is not the great success of, of the mission. The success is that we could demonstrate a full end-to-end -end verification. So from taking the picture, encoding, transferring via laser, and decode it on the ground, that is the major result because with this, we can, we can show a scenario which comes very close to a customer's need in the end. And that shows the um, capability to take it over into, um, into a commercial market by TSAT in the end. And just to give you some numbers, so we had in uh, during this link, this was in middle of September, we had one and a half minute of link. We could transfer roughly 2,000 error-free pictures of this one. Um, and uh, this shows the, uh, the big advantages of laser communication at that point. As I said, Osiris for CubeSat is our base technology. And the next step is to transfer the capabilities of laser communication into the intersatellite link domain. OSIRIS for CubeSat is a pure transmitter for direct to Earth, so transferring data from a satellite to the ground. And now we want to connect satellite with each other because a major um, use case of CubeSats are constellations or mega constellations. And also there with the increasing number of satellites, the number of channels increases as well. And therefore, we have to find solutions, um, especially when we think about uh, registrations like from ITU or channel crosstalk. Therefore, we provide a solution based on the OSIRIS for CubeSat payload, which you can see here in the first engineering model of the Cube ISL payload. So we reuse most of the parts and our um, standard interfaces allow to easily extend them by other subsystems. So for example, in Cube ISL, we use an uh, ADFA, so an, a fiber amplifier to amplify the signal that we get more laser power and to be more independent from the satellite for the receiving of the signal and the N and decoding to do it inside the terminal, we extend it with a data handling unit. In the first demonstrator mission, we will show the capabilities of this terminal in an intraplane scenario. So the satellites are, are flying directly behind each other. And, uh, but this is not what we want in a final mission. So this is the first demonstrator. And the next step is to extend this terminal with a cross pointing assembly, which consists of a, of a prism and the prism steers the beam in a 180 degree hemisphere that we can also serve in the future missions, then also cross-plane or interplane scenarios with the same terminal. Besides the classical optical communication, the next step is uh, towards very secure communication, especially in a uh, in military or political context. You want to have fully secure links, and therefore quantum key distribution is one next step. There we are working in two projects or two parts of one project. It's Cube 1 and Cube 2. 
Um, this is a cooperation between um, several universities um, and research institutes like uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in, in Munich, uh, Max Planck Institute in Erlangen, Center of Telematic, who builds the satellite, and OHB as a commercial partner here again, um, because we need this strong um, connection to the industry at that point. And on the on this picture, you can see the first payload of Cube One, which will demonstrate um, precursor experiments towards quantum key distribution. And in Cube Two, we extend this terminal by a um, by a telescope to um, uh, to close the link budget for a real quantum key distribution to generate a key optically at the ground station. So far, we were talking talking about the transmitter part. Um, we at DLR are also working, of course, on the receiver part because we have to get the data down, and therefore we have an um, or we further improved our optical ground station. Uh, it was one and a half years ago when we extended our existing one from a forty centimeter aperture to a eighty centimeter aperture. But the major advantage we have with this new optical ground station is the QD part. So we, before we had all the measurement equipment directly attached to the telescope, and now with the QD path, we are able to reflect the received signal through a tube in a lab, which is below the, the optical ground station. And on this table, uh, you can then further analyze the signal. We have uh, adaptive optics, uh, we already heard from from Julian uh, deformable mirrors to to correct the atmospheric effects, and uh, there you have much broader capabilities, and you can install much more uh, measurement equipment to characterize the atmosphere to qu for quantum key distribution and also for the capability of receiving the signal. And you can build up everything together without um, changing the setup for each and every mission. That was so far the wrap up of the um, of some um, projects we have at DLR uh, towards uh, laser communication, and yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Then, um, if someone of the speakers maybe have a question, I'm looking now from our question and answer session because um, you know where we are when we when I visit the DLR, we're also we're discussing the challenges, and I believe you're also mentioned right this uh, fine pointing of the entire assembly uh, of the entire cube set, right? To actually to be able to align it, but as you mentioned, one of the um, uh, uh, how to say, a next step is to communicate your data back to Earth. And how are the developments with the ground stations? Because I think we have an interesting partner here, which is actually actively working in developing the ground uh, segment. And I would like to offer Olivier uh, from Care Labs to unmute himself and share his uh, suggestions, B because I believe you two can be really excellent partners in developing the ground segment. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, um, yes great. Um, uh, it's a great transition because uh, we are very happy to see this pixel mission uh, successful. We know the challenges of bringing data back to Earth and we are uh, first congratulations to, to the DLR. And uh, our goal at Kylabs is to uh, work on the other part, uh, not the, the, um, uh, the laser communication terminals, but uh, the ground. Um, I am trying to share uh, just one slide to summarize this. Uh, I hope it's working now. Not yet. Not okay. yet. No, now, uh, now it works. OK, it's supposed to work. Great. So um, a quick introduction about Kylabs. Um, we are a company based in France. And what you see here in this beautiful picture is, uh, well, not a representative day in Brittany. Uh, usually it's not as blue skies as, the, as this. Uh, however, it happens. And um, in our building, we have this beautiful optical ground station. What we are working on is optical technology. 
uh, that are based on um, beam shaping and uh, laser light manipulation. We apply this to many sectors, including telecommunications, laser processing, um, fibers, uh, defense. But most uh, importantly for today, we are working on uh, making the laser communication through the atmosphere uh, possible and reliable. This is all due to this MPLC key technology that offers turbulence mitigation in both uplink and downlink with a different technology than adaptive optics um, that is uh, more suited to uh, communications. Uh, it's based on uh, spatial modes that are uh, found in optical fibers. So it's a technique that is uh, working well for uh, telecom. Well, adaptive optics is perfect for anywhere you have imagers and uh, astronomy uh, pictures to make. Um, Kylab's uh, mission is to make uh, laser communication possible through the atmosphere uh, with uh, optical ground stations for space to ground SATCOM. Uh, the goal is to be compatible with all available standards, CCSDS, uh, which is developed by uh, different space agencies, and also SDA, which is pushed by uh, the US uh, defense constellations and is becoming kind of a new industry standard. Um, we're also working on line of sight, uh, free space optical comms for uh, vehicle connectivity uh, through the atmosphere. Right now, we are working on several um, ground stations that are on contract uh, and uh, different partners. We are really happy to participate in the Optica meetings because we are looking for many types of partnerships that could be strategic, commercial, um, that could be technical, that could be co-demonstrations. Um, and uh, we already have some demonstrations and Public, uh, mutual publications done with the DLR in the past uh, and some um, we hope to have more coming in the future but uh, it's not exclusive of course the goal is to make this a reality together um, break this chicken and egg issue by bringing both ground and space solutions uh, and we need uh, support from the industry as well as support from the market uh, and uh, we, we're happy to discuss this uh, with uh, all partners and uh, and viewers of this uh, of this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Ivian. So Benjamin, when you're looking at the advances of the K-Labs, um, any comments or questions from your side? Uh, yes, uh, it's indeed going into the the right direction. Um, Olivier, you mentioned the chicken and egg problem, uh, which was uh, for many years really an issue for laser communication. Um, I have the feeling that we, uh, in the meantime, could solve it. There are more and more terminals in space, um, and more and more ground station uh, popping out of the uh, out of the ground. Um, I think the most important part is the standardization. Um, you need um, standards to communicate with each other that uh, people are also uh, know what they need, uh, what in which direction they have to make their. The development and I think this is uh, um, this is really great that um, uh, to see that we are working in the uh, on the same topic and um, also supporting um, these standards like CCSDS and SDA uh, where also we intend to be compatible together with TSAT um, for example the cube ISL payload which will be then compatible or taken over as Scott twenty. Uh, from uh, from TSAT, which will then be comp compatible to the SDA standard. And I think this is the, the major part that we connect both worlds or both parts uh, to each other. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And uh, I agree with the standardization, which is uh, uh, an absolute prerequisite uh, for deployment. I think the chicken and egg issue is now uh, solved. We have both, uh, we have we have uh, terminals in space, we have uh, ground stations uh, on Earth, and we have several, it's not just one or two um, projects, it's uh, it's becoming industrial, it's, it's becoming real, and it's uh, uh, the numbers are growing uh, exponentially every year. Uh, now, if we want this to be a, a commercial and uh, um, uh, industrial success, we need to 
uh, bring the industry together uh, using standards. Uh, it's absolutely right. Uh, I think one of the first um, interventions from the from today uh, was the um, uh, a description of all the ESA pro programs with uh, Earth observation um, satellites, and there are more and more. All these are producing tremendous amounts of data. I heard about wildfire. Um, uh, we will speak about imaging. this later, so and don't I, I, worry. I just, so we need the yeah, we need to bring that data back. Yeah, and uh, one one thing I uh, I would like to add um, because of laser communication, always the first question is what about cloud? And this is exactly the the solution. We have to build uh, something like a ground station network. Um, we have this in the Arab world. Uh, where several companies have their UHF or S1 ground station distributed around the globe. And this is also what we what we need for laser communication. Because in the end, the customer is not interested of uh, over which ground station he gets his data. He wants to get his data. And when we have 8, 10, 12 optical ground stations around the globe, then we do not have the issue with cloud coverage anymore because during one flyover, there will be always at least one ground station where you can downlink your data. And when we talk about gigabit, um, uh, like in the in the um, in the modern solutions of for CubeSats, uh, then you need just one flyover, maybe less than a minute, and you can already download all your data, and then you can con uh, contribute them uh, all over the globe. And I think that's the that's the major part that that we think in this direction of interoperability, um, because this is the a way we can serve then this as a um, as a service to the customer. I have a, actually a question to both of you, and forgive me, it's maybe also also to Roger and to the other specialists. Maybe it's a little bit naive. When you know when you can imagine that you need to shoot the entire light to communicate the data from the satellite back to Earth, which level of the output power do we roughly talk about that needs to reach the ground? Do you have maybe like a rule of thumb? How much has to arrive? If we're not speaking of quantum communication, right? When you need one photon, ideally, but really to have a reliable transmission. Any ideas? Because I think someone in the room might have an idea. So what are the values are? Hmm. So I, Benjamin, um, uh, you'll brave I this not... question. <laughs> Yes, so um, especially in the, in the part of the development of the optical ground station, we also develop our receiver in-house. So there are different technology like uh, pin diodes or um, mainly used in our systems are um, avalanche photodiodes who have um, certain uh, certain sensitivity in the area of uh, nanowatt or even picowatt. So it's uh, hard to say specific numbers uh, because in the link budget, there are so many parameters which you have to consider. So the um, the power density, which is uh, transmitted from, from the laser terminal, the aperture of the ground station, um, um, the data rate is very crucial. So it's a huge difference if you transmit, if you want to have the um, advantages in uh, comparably low data rate, like 10 Mbit, when you just want to have a reliable connection, or if you want to have a high throughput, like a gigabit, then um, that, then you're already in a, uh, in a mag magnitude of 100 um, in, in the difference. So this is, this is hard, hard to tell. I asked you actually this question not out of um, uh, maybe with a little bit of the uh, um, uh, backside idea because I wanted to actually pose the same question to Fale Grand from Gentech, uh, uh, Gentech that are actually specializing not only on measuring the power but also characterizing the beams that, they, that the satellites might uh, send to one another. So Fel, maybe you have a, um, an angle or yeah. let's say a touch on this question. Yeah, thank you, Olga, for uh, for the introduction. That's a very good question. And uh, so I'm Fel Legrand at Gentech EO. We measure laser power, energy, beam profile. I have a, I have a slide to show you guys. But that was exactly my question um, when uh, when was mentioned the clouds issues. Like, are there any standards like the maximum power that could be used to bring data bank back down to Earth and to like to kind of vaporize clouds? Could we use like I don't know 
1 watt, 10 watts, 100 watts, I mean, uh, safety issues, of course. But that's an excellent question. How far can we go? And if we develop sensors sensitive enough, picowatt, nanowatt, so on, um, we could get the signal by, back down to Earth and, and use it for data transmission. But what's the maximum power we could use to do that? That's an excellent question. Uh, okay, would you like me to go through my, um, my slide yes, already? Yes, please. Yeah, all right. Sure, let me grab the uh, share screen window here. There it is. Okay. Could you see it? Yes, crystal clear. You get. All righty. So, sounds good. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm Fel, a sales manager here at Gentech EO here in Quebec, Canada. Um, we brand ourselves are your partners for accuracy in laser performance measurements. And we, we've been doing that for more than 50 years now. So we provide uh, tools, detectors, uh, laser beam diagnostics tools for applications, including laser beam tracking, ranging, docking applications, energy transfers, and data transfers using lasers, of course, data transmission and optical terminals are uh, uh, seeing an exponential growth. So that's very really interesting to be part of this community and an innovation uh, driver. So, or any manufacturing processes using lasers, by the way, marking, cutting, etching, welding, and so on. So we can provide tools to make sure the lasers are performing as expected. So we don't make the lasers, but our solutions cover from thermal pile detectors for average power measurements to pyroelectric sensors for pulse-to-pulse -pulse energy measurements when the signal is pulsed. Um, custom broadband high dynamic range pyros going to the terahertz range, by the way. So um, UV, visible, IR, near IR, terahertz, we cover it all. Uh, we do sensitive photodiodes as well and beam providers. Again, for beam. So, so beam profiling, uh, tracking, and so on. We have the ability to customize pretty much everything that we do. We have more than 700 standard products, but we can customize. And my goal here today is to hear about all the requirements, all the fancy lasers, and the, the wavelength, the pulse energies, the pulse width, the rep rates, the beam sizes, and so on. What, what do you guys are doing? What do you use? What do you need? And what kind of tools do you need to measure them? Make sure they are performing as expected. So, um, and while doing that, even when we customize, we maintain the, the highest level of damage thresholds. We're talking power density, energy densities, uh, average power measurement um, handling, and uh, vast communication options for controls as well in the lab or in the field, and the highest quality and um, the highest calibration standards to help accelerate your operations. I like the, those uh, four target uh, pictures. So we define accuracy as the combination of two things. It's kind of, I think it's important to, to, uh, to mention it. First, the uh, measurement repeatability, that's the R here. Repeatability, so how close consecutive measurements are when they are taken in the same conditions. And then the C, that's the calibration uncertainty, which is how close your measurements are to the true definitions of the watt or the joule, for example, depending on what you need to measure. And when you hit both, when you hit good repeatability and good um, calibration uncertainty, then you have accuracy. So long story short, we enable reliable, simple test and measurement solutions for designing, manufacturing, and operating laser systems on the ground or in orbit. We don't make systems space ready yet. We we'll let our customers, integrators do that, but we provide all the uh, base equipment to do so. And we can, again, customers for vacuum, temperature, communication, so and so on, for, again, beam diagnostics purposes. Looking forward to talk more, uh, to hear about any uh, specific lasers that you've been using and your requirements so we, uh, so we would be able to help uh, making sure you measure the laser correctly. Thank you. Any Thank questions? you very much. And it is great to have you in the room. You know how it works, Phil. Uh, what can you do for others and what can others right. do for you? Well, what can others do for you? Uh, buy our detectors, that's for sure. <laughs> and what can we do for them? <laughs> yeah, what could we make for them? Make sure we first qualify the exact detectors that will be needed to measure laser power, laser energy, laser beam profile properly. So we have application knowledge. We know lasers. Again, we don't make them, but we've been selling detectors to measure them for 50 years. This means that given a uh, given wavelength, a power level, down to the picowatt up to hundreds of kilowatt, um, knowing the pulse width, repetition rate, the energy levels in joules, any, anything that could make your laser what they are. If we know about that, okay, we have history. Okay, we've seen those applications. Maybe you would need a pyro sensor customized for using vacuum and customized for beam tracking accuracy for docking applications and so on. So we have the knowledge, we have the application knowledge to uh, guide either using either 
selecting just a standard detector that comes calibrated with NIST traceability and a good um, option for connectivity. You're going to Thank computer, you very much, Phil. There are many people who well. have very strong comments about your presentation. And one sure. of them is actually a person who is texting something very interesting for us right now. Mihai Muresang, thank you very much for joining the meeting today. You have a very interesting comment about the wavelength. Please voice it so everyone can contribute. Mihai? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Please switch on uh, your camera nice, if you can. Nice, we want to okay. see you as well. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's, we are two here, actually. And only one is Mihai. This is Jan speaking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, essentially, when, when considering the atmospheric communication with the, with the laser, the 1.5 micron or 1030 would be your first choice, right? Because there is problems with the with the water in there. There is absorption band. So my my question, as simple as it is, is why not to uh, switch towards uh, longer wavelengths, where the where there is atmospheric transmission window from the first point of view, and the second point of view, uh, the the safety limits. Uh, for the laser power at that range are more benevolent than for shorter wavelengths. You can give more power to the beam. Benjamin, Roger, why are we using 1550? Um, yes, I can uh, already uh, uh, answer this from our perspective. Uh, so the main decision for 1550, so we are working mainly in the C-band. So everything between uh, 1530 and 1567, 1590 for the uplink, but it's a, that's another part. Um, this is mainly driven by the availability of the components. So we are very close to the industry and we, from the um, beginning of the, of the uh, development on, we always had a product in mind. And this considers also the availability of parts, uh, compatibility to other systems, and uh, also the price. And uh, components like um, transmitter, receiver, are already used in classical telecommunication, like fiber telecommunication for internet or broadband networks. So um, the variety of uh, available components is much, much larger in this wavelength. And this uh, decreases on the, on the one hand, the price of the terminal. And um, the, uh, on the other hand, also the, the effort of the development. And with this, we can transfer this benefit also, to when we think about mass productions, um, uh, when we think about um, uh, constellations where you, you need dozens or hundreds or thousands of terminals, then uh, every single chip where you can or every single part where, where you can save a little bit of money is, uh, is then worth it. Maybe money is important when, when we're going to volume production. But Roger, uh, yeah. for many years, ISA has been leading lots of links at 1060 and also at longer wavelengths. Is that is that is the 1550 now the standard for optical communications in space? Yes, I believe so. And uh, I very much agree with what Benjamin was saying. Uh, also, when you look at the new space sector, uh, particularly CubeSats, uh, they've leveraged extensively uh, terrestrial commercial off the shelf components and uh, use them in space, uh, particularly for the reasons of very low costs. So I think this is an excellent example of um, COTS components being leveraged because they're there for other purposes. And I think looking at other wavelengths, um, if there were other terrestrial uses for, for needing components in, in other wavelengths, then they could be leveraged in the future as well, of course, then with the economies of scale and production and so on. I believe mid-wave infrared is coming really strong. Mid-infrared optics, mid-infrared lasers, mid-infrared detectors are coming really strong. I believe it because I know a person at Iridian called Jason Palivar. Jason, uh, please tell us what's your take on this, because you've been working already with the Canada Canadian Space Agency. Uh, yeah, so um, there, there certainly is, is has been some development in Canada. There's the uh, Optical Satcom Consortium that was doing some work, but really it was at a, at a research level in terms of mid-wave IR communications, ex exactly trying to address that that uh, seeing through clouds uh, issue. So you know there are there are components. There there are there are you know optical filtering can be done in the mid-wave infrared, but I think the 
the the sources and detectors are, are much more of the, the 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 challenge to be addressed so so uh, you know as 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 everyone else has been mentioning yeah right now trust uh traditional uh telecom c-band is is where it's at uh certainly for optical inner satellite links it only makes sense uh, in, in orbit uh but even even space to ground at this point you know midway wire i think is really really exploratory at this point i'd say i mean certainly the, the kind of uh of components that, that that we can produce and do produce for uh for um, Earth observation uh, applications, for example, here at Iridium, in terms of optical filtering, but in terms of communication, it still is dominated in the the traditional C band. And we also would like to give to the give the floor to a company that comes all the way from Vilnius, Lithuania, Andrius from Optoman. Thank you very much for being with us today, and I think you have a question for some of the people in the room. I will come back to Andrius in a second, but now I can't yes, wait. Yes, Okay, in, okay. Uh, so you, you please tell us, it. voice your question. Yeah, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, so actually, uh, recently I've just discovered that uh, ESA and NASA started to use different transmitted and reflective wavelengths. Uh, this was in order to separate those. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure whether this is correct or not. So I, I would be very happy to, 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 hear, to hear comments and insights. Roger, would you like to comment? Allow me to write down that question and try to find an answer myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I couldn't answer that question, unfortunately. <laughs> it, it is time now to go to a person that means a lot to Optica and to our space activities. We're going to welcome to the floor Laser Light Holdings and Robert Bramley. Robert, thank you very much for being with us. Tell us what's on your mind so far. I think you have some comments for the people and then you can share your slides. Can you see them? Crystal clear, but please uh, go presentation mode. Uh, there we go. And okay, I'm gonna have to, once I get some help with this, I can't get yeah. into it. I've been having trauma. I'm on the road in a really bad hotel. Oh, the hotels are fantastic. You can yeah. go to a slide a slideshow. Okay. Let me just go ahead and get just jump into this right now. I, I'm happy to share it as well as one you sent me. Okay. Why don't you put it up? That'd be great. Okay. While you're doing that, my comments that I put in the chat were one, in my opinion, uh SDA and CCSDS are service requirements. They are not standards. Standards are going to be driven by this group and other vendors when they get to scale. Uh, if you build a closed architected system like SDA for security reasons, you can't have an open architected system that anybody can connect to, get on and get off. So I'd be very careful about using the word standard with US government requirements, particularly the SDA requirements. Uh, is it up? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was going to, I was originally, this is kind of a bait and switch. Uh, I was originally going to uh, talk about laser light, uh, but I decided that I would rather talk about the near frontier, which is CISLUNAR, because most of you are building near Earth. And we, in fact, are looking at uh, both in the United States and in partnership with ESA, we're looking at uh, essentially CISLUNAR as the next near market. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, where we are right now is in wave one, which is mostly where uh, your technology development is going. LEO, GEO, uh, mission-oriented temporary visits, uh, both in terms of deep space as well as uh, in, in uh, CISLUNAR, and then mostly in the, uh, go back one slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, where we're seeing in, uh, in the United States and also in Europe is a transition into what we call wave two, commercial epoch. Uh, that's cis lunar, lunar uh, space, and a di a deeper space, and then independent of government funding. Uh, Artemis is running behind. That's a challenge for it. And there's global competition as well, uh, policy making, et cetera. But this creates a commercial opportunity for private firms to step into this five-year epoch. Uh, you will not be able to build in wave three, which is settlement epoch, which is really sustainability without the infrastructure in between wave one and wave three. In other words, 
What's going to happen over the next five to six years is a significant spend on infrastructure. Next slide. The infrastructure that we're, we're speaking of is uh, basically the market essentials to make CISLUNAR a opportunity as well as a reliable, sustainable, sustainable market. Right now, the three pillars in CISLUNAR that are in development are transportation, communications, and power. You can't do anything without all three. Uh, as recent as some communications problems relative to intuitive machines or iSpace, uh, they got there, but comms to a certain degree and related comms uh, support uh, resulted in what would be mission failure. Uh, power is still a challenge on sustainability, particularly on landers on the moon. Latency relative to communications is a lunar killer. Uh, with, it has to be dealt with. But if all three can be developed, and they are under development both in Europe, US, uh, Japan, and other markets, including China, they support the capital investments, the meshed infrastructures, the pro-growth rule dr drivers, because there are more people out there who are doing things, and security. They create opportunities for logistics hubs, peering points, intermodal depots, refueling depots, et cetera. All of these are going to require your technology. They're going to require more than a CubeSat. They're going to require more than small sats. They're going to require permanent on-station physical infrastructure. Next slide. We all know what the problem is, and particularly in CisLunar, and that's swap. Uh, everyone really has to balance swap. Uh, the idea here is, is that you create a reciprocal infrastructure where those who have swap challenges can basically offload some of their requirements to something that would be, in fact, have greater swap to give. Swap as a service, if you will. And in that swap exchange, you end up having to be able to communicate with each other, which is networking. Next slide. There you go. The new space data market, which is essentially the end product of what you all are building, because you're building transmission systems, you're building software, you're building infrastructure, cameras, uh, those that are gathering data, with, whether it be for the Earth, EOS data, or in CisLunar and around the moon, spectral data, all transition across this sea. And as you move across it, you're going to need PNT, SSA, and STM data. Next slide. So what does it look like? Comstar is planning on deploying its satellite system as a NAP. And that's a basically a network access point. Uh, those of you who are tel telecom people, like NAP of Americas, uh, uh, is a central point, a meet-me point for communications infrastructure for purposes of not just relay, storage, in addition to that, buffering. It's a dual system or a hybrid system of RF and optical. It'll operate on 1550, but by some discussions, Roger, we may also carry a 1060-64 payload. So we have the capability of running both of those systems. They are there, it's there to support companies that are around the moon in, in what would be a lower Earth orbit or on the moon with low that have low swap. So instead of going 240,000 miles or DTE to be able to do command and control or TT and C. They can go to Comstar, and Comstar in turn can either relay or have onboard command and control, very much similar to an AWS outpost, where the hub is the Earth, the outpost is Comstar, until more facilities are built on the moon when they become the outpost and Comstar becomes the hub. It connects to its sister company, LaserLight. Uh, next slide. LaserLight, as most of you know, is a planned global distribution system, which is both which is only optical, there is no RF on laser light, but it also has 200 ground stations to support the laser light network. I mentioned earlier that we need, there was a reference about eight to 10 ground stations. Our evaluation is if you're going to do carrier grade service in optics on the, on the globe, you need 200 and you need that kind of scale to match up with the scale of the ground networks that you're supporting. Next slide. So you have now an end-to-end -end service where you have Comstars relaying into LaserLight and either going directly to RF ground stations and or to optical for distribution on the LaserLight network. 
what you have at the end of this, which is a number of you have mentioned, is you're taking what we already have on the earth, whether it be cameras or optics or transistors or integrated circuits, next slide, and you're extending it one layer up to the moon. And you're literally moving the earth technologies and protocols and standards as they exist today, such as I'll be so bold to say that from the moon to a data center on the earth, they'll be operating on 709 gamma. That's an ITU protocol for optical transport networks. It does not differentiate between fiber, subsea cable, or now free space optics. It's an end-to-end -end protocol. That would then drive what your, uh, your spectrum would be. That would also drive your waveform. Uh, and it also would be compatible with equipment today. Uh, so you can drop the slides, go back to my video here. Um, I have, uh, that's it, just go on back to the video. I have one other slide I thought I'd put up just because I can't help myself. Um, and this is about laser light. Somebody mentioned earlier, the key to this is going to be integration. This is what the future is. The satellite system fully interconnected to either data center, central offices, pond, uh, uh, OTN switching, or subsea cable, all as a single network, differentiated only by where that network ground station and that interconnection point would be. Let me stop there. Questions? Thank you very much, Bob. Do we have a questions from the auditorium? I think I don't see yet any in the chat, but let's think, let's people, uh, let um, our listeners process, and then I, I might have, have a one, question. Yeah. Okay, I might so have go one. ahead. Yeah. Hey, Robert, thank you very much for this presentation. You mentioned RF links, optical links, fiber optic links. Do you see any room for terahertz radiation as a way to transfer data? It's more divergent, but lays on RF, and uh, we talk terahertz for 60 or this kind of communication future standards, what do you, what do you see? I, if I'm wrong, and that's just kind of a CTO question, I'm a finance guy, but let me see if I can swing an answer at you. Um, we're operating, I believe, at 196.5 terahertz. And, okay. uh, and that, that would put us at the outer limit of probably the C band and maybe the, and maybe the S or the X band um, in, in FSO. Uh, we already know that in our fiber uh, plant and our sub C plant, we're operating at 196 as well in terms of the C band. So we're at the upper end of the C band, uh, in the upper, our, our planning would be upper end of the C band or upper end of the S band. So I think the answer to your question is, yeah. Uh, but then when you do that, you look at, at the telecom, you look at terahertz converted to, uh, gigabits or terabits. And with Nokia's new PSC6 card, where they're getting 800 gigs on fiber with long distance interconnection, I mean, regeneration, 2000 kilometers, it is yeah. possible to converge those two high up on the terahertz band, which would be again, essentially get you terabit uh, service lengths uh, on fiber and then translating that into FSO, obviously okay. with eye safety concerns and, and, and measuring that. But I think the answer is a qualified yes, but again, I'm a finance guy. I only listen to the CTO. <laughs> I don't know. That's I don't a good know answer for a finance guy. I don't know half of what he says, but I, I do <laughs> listen to that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Bob. And uh, actually, following the con uh, the conversation, I would like to invite to the floor uh, Mark Lutkovitz from Fiber Reality, who I believe would give us an additional view to expand. You know your your overview that you've given already on the on the different levels on the tech more technical aspect of the networks and see what the uh, the commercial reality might look like. Mark, well, I appreciate that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just need to share my screen. Just bear with me. That would be lovely. And here we go. All right. Yeah, so uh, I've been doing, I'm uh, making some projections lately, uh, including a couple of months ago that I'll that I'll show on, on on the next slide as well. And uh, you know, we're in an optical boom period, uh, which is kind of nice since uh, this market could be really awful at times, the optics market, but. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have AI providing support for uh, fiber needs to, to support, optics needs to, to support AI, artificial intelligence. 
And so, but it's very important that market research firms provide accurate projections or as accurate as possible, not get into a game of uh, providing the, uh, you know, the latest uh, or the highest numbers possible. Uh, so we go, if we go to the projections. Um, now, if you look at the first uh, two big bullets, uh, these are numbers that we came up uh, a couple uh, a couple of months ago or so, and they're still pretty good. I was, you know, got good verification on them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, pretty decent growth. Uh, I, I, uh, I know there are people who are going to, you know, disagree that, you know, the numbers are uh, probably higher than that, but I think this, these are pretty solid, solid for the present. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see more than a launch per week out of Starlink, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, it's also important to note that, uh, you know, with the eight lasers uh, on, on the second big bullet point, uh, uh, you know, you do have four working and four reserve and backup. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's important to uh, keep in mind. And, and I think that 20,000 to 30,000 lasers for FSO per year is pretty good. So we go to the th uh, third major bullet point, 25 and 26. Again, uh, I have a, a, a very high confidence level in this. Uh, Looking at four thousand LEO satellites launched per year, uh, and, and uh, within those in those in that two year time frame, I'm a little bit nervous about you know going uh, you know going beyond five year projections at any time. So, you know the the ten thousand by twenty thirty plus, uh, you know that uh, that could easily be optimistic, and and twenty thirty plus of course could mean anything beyond twenty thirty, but. Uh, so if we just look at the other points, uh, it's important again to note the 10 to 20% re replacement ratio. The fact that you do have uh, the uh, you know four to uh, five uh, laser communications uh, terminals, the LCTs, uh, and you know go, going in the various directions. And uh, you know there is hope for uh, getting the getting that traffic down to Earth, uh, as you see. You have that east going to Earth and and uh, on the laser, and uh, so. Yes, uh, but uh, get, getting to some of the last points, you do have two working lasers because you're, you're, you're dealing in a vacuum here. It's not like you're doing uh, FSOs uh, uh, you know, in a terrestrial type of environment. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, it's coherent 100G now, it'll go to coherent, coherent 4G later. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, again, these numbers are quite optimistic. Uh, again, I'm nervous about going beyond, you know, five years. Uh, uh, and uh, but I, I'm sure people are going to say, oh, it's going to be much higher than that, and, and, and maybe it is. But uh, uh, what usually happens is when you try to be very conservative on projections, you, you wind up being high anyway. Uh, and again, uh, just to make, make it clear, I'm talking about people who are really serious. You know, uh, talking about companies that have the funding, that have the launching capabilities, not companies who are pretending to maybe get into the space. I, I won't get into any names here. But uh, but that's about it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Do we have maybe questions from the auditorium? Um, because I actually have one, Mark. Because you know, if when when you look at these projections, I believe they will make uh, many people quite happy in the room. <laughs> Well, that but makes very... me nervous too, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but very often, you know, when we look at the, some technologies and, um, uh, for instance, if we look at quantum and when the the most optimistic appro appro approaches tell us that, okay, the quantum going to scale tremendously in the next five to ten years, very often it comes back to the question, will the entire supply and uh, supply chain support this scale, uh, this uh, rapid right, um, um, uh, increase of the volume. So do you think, uh, what, what are your numbers I'll tell you, uh, among the, let's say, the infrastructure and the entire supply of the uh, supply chain of the new space, are the, is there already a life, um, is there already a capability to support uh, these, um, um, basically this growth? Oh, there's, there's no question about it. Uh, you have companies that, that do have the resources to, to do it. The companies like Amazon that, that's involved in this, uh, you know, there's no question about it. There's also the need, uh, especially from a government standpoint, uh, uh, to for cybersecurity reasons and that kind of thing, to, to build these networks. Uh, uh, there are geopolitical ramifications too that's going to you know, that that play a role. And uh, you know, just to have uh, a redundant network in, in space is very important. So. 
you know, it, we may disagree on the actual numbers, but, uh, you know, I think this is a hopeful uh, trend. And uh, it's also uh, uh, positive in the sense that really free space optics hasn't been able to happen yet really in a big way in terrestrial environment. And, and so, uh, you know, it's nice to see that a technology could come about and uh, you'll find its niche. And I think it has. Thank you very much, Mark, for your insights. Thank but you. well, I think I think we should um, maybe close the part on the communications and the free space optical communications, and actually switch to observations, because also we know that in the latest tendencies with the with the sustainability and ecological monitoring playing a role, actually the. Uh, purpose of many missions is uh, related to the Earth observation and hyperspectral imaging. And here I would like to invite to the floor uh, the Lucas Krempfele the, uh, from Aurora Tech and to, to present their solution for wildfire monitoring, based, which is basically one of the applications of the large scale um, Earth observation. Lucas, please share your slide and well, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction. So yeah, so now we will make a, a very much uh, a turn here and we'll go back to um, Earth observation again. And um, yeah, I will just present you quickly what Aurora Tech is doing and also show you uh, what is new space all about. So I think you already heard uh, from Roger Walker in the beginning um, that we are doing wildfire detection and just to show you why that is uh, required. So basically, all over the world, we have wildfires ongoing, even if it's not in the media. So right now, um, you can see a picture here. So there is quite a lot of fires ongoing and um, everywhere in the world. And that means um, that 10% of the global CO2 is being emitted by these wildfires. In general, when we look into the wildfires a bit more in detail, um, we found out that actually these remote wildfires that they remain mainly undetected. And uh, that means uh, that these wildfires can grow and then they're not able to fight them anymore. So that's just why is Aurotech doing what we're doing? And I will just go a bit more in the technology to, uh, um, I think that's most interesting for everyone here. Um, so basically how we are doing um, wildfire detection. So I think uh, that's a very logical step um, that we do thermal infrared imagery from space. Um, so um, here I brought you a very, uh, it's a very lame image of a long wave infrared uh, picture. So you can see someone with a lighter in the background. You can see even also some um, hands and arms. So they are warmer um, than the background. And you can clearly see ambient temperature. Uh, but what we want to do is uh, basically looking for wildfires. And uh, yeah, these wildfires are quite hot. And therefore, we introduced um, another uh, wavelength band in our uh, thermal infrared camera. So already in the discussions, there were uh, the word uh, midwave infrared was coming up as well. So three to five micrometer, that is also what we are um, looking onto it. So here you can see then uh, midwave um, infrared image um, where you can clearly see the hot object or here in this case, the fire with an extreme contrast. So you cannot even see something in the background. So because it's um, the nice use of uh, midwave infrared. Yeah, um, um, so um, basically, um, this is uh, the idea behind it, but you also need to have systems up there in space. Um, so we have now currently uh, launched last year the most recent system. That's what you can see here on that image. Um, so this contains two thermal infrared cameras um, with each uh, three bands. So that's uh, quite a lot of data that is being produced. So it's uh, very important to downlink all the data. Also, so a side note here. Um, and as we cannot um, downlink all the data, because it's uh, quite a lot at the moment, um, we are using then a GPU for onboard image processing, uh, which is then used to already have like fire detection or uh, subsampled products already generated on the satellite. Yeah, also what we have, we have um, near real-time data transmission. So for us, it's quite important getting the data as quickly as possible down. Uh, from the satellite. So this is also a bit of an issue for us with optical communication. So that is a no-go for us when then the next ground station is blocked by clouds. 
uh, we really need to have the fastest latency of the data. Cool, yeah, then um, a bit more images. I think that's more interesting uh, for you. So basically uh, what we are doing, we are uh, developing the camera mainly in-house so from the lenses um, to everything else, all the electronics, mechanicals, uh, uh, parts, everything is developed in-house. So on the left, you can see um, some of the singlet lenses that we integrate uh, with a company together here. In Munich, on the right, you can see the um, telescopes that we are using as the thermal infrared lenses. And you can see also a lot of other components that we are using for building up such a thermal infrared camera in the end. So um, this is like um, where we are uh, standing right now, um, as we are also want to talk about challenges. So at the moment, uh, we are scaling up and also building more and more technology. So on the left, you can see um, the satellite that was already presented by Roger Walker. So this is the Forest 3 satellite, um, which is here already integrated with all the subsystems and uh, ready for testing. And um, another challenge, is, uh, challenge that we are facing right now is the um, scaling up of the production um, for a small series production. So we are heading towards uh, launching a lot of the system up into space in order to make a very fast wildfire detection possible. And therefore, our challenge is to scale up. So. Uh, basically, um, just also to show you how these images look like. So I already talked about um, the thermal imager in space. So on the left, you can see um, an example image that we're using for um, optical performance um, um, analysis. So Port Said in Egypt, and you can see nicely how sharp the channels are, which are going to the, to the Mediterranean Sea. And on the right, you can see um, a fire detected on in Greece on Rhodes. And you can see also how nicely um, the images look like, the thermal infrared images. So it's a pretty awesome field to work in. Yeah, also um, uh, just to close up uh, the small presentation. So basically um, we want to build up a full constellation. So this year, uh, we are bringing up eight uh, systems up into space. Um, additionally, then the first very own um, satellite platform as well. And uh, that's a very exciting um, year for us and yeah, for all the optical parts. So we're also open for uh, collaboration and uh, we're also open for um, new uh, manufacturers for lenses, for example. So that's also very happy to Thank you very you. much, Lucas. You can't imagine what it means for Olga, for Elise, for the entire Optica team, for me to have you here looking for partners to help you. We understand not only the business, but also the importance of what you do for the world. So thank you very much for that. Let's find you partners. Let's find you partners. Let's go first to one of the key companies in Thin Fin Coatings for Optics Manufacturing Optica. We go, of course, to Gooch and Housego. Thank you very much, JJ, for being with us today. Tell us what you do and tell us how you could help Lucas. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Gooch and Housego is actually a conglomerate of about 13 facilities worldwide and covering, you know, material growth for, for yeah, laser sources. people. You have one slide, right? Just put it up there. Uh, I do, I do, absolutely, yeah. Um, so covering uh, you know, you know, material and, 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 and crystal growth for lasers, but also fiber and uh, you know, acoustic optical devices and, and switches and, and things that, that would cover a lot of the optical telecoms that we've talked through so far. But as the, the forum has shifted its focus to uh, earth observation, we also have a robust set of capability in both um, you know, precision optics with respect to polishing and diamond turning and thin film coating uh, out of facilities in the UK. But uh, personally, I'm our product manager for optical systems. So, uh, you know, primarily imaging systems uh, corrected for various wave bands. And our, you know, our historical uh, value add has been custom solutions, things that are designed to fit particular payloads or particular sensor formats and fields of view and work over given temperatures within a certain volume. Uh, but a lot of time has been spent on the call this this uh, this morning talking to uh, innovation, and I think that that part of innovation is not just 
creating these new technologies, but also realizing where market is driving commercialization and productization of things that you have worked and developed historically. And I think that, you know, the private sector, you know, broadening its reach into low Earth orbit, uh, you know, SpaceX putting two rockets into space the Sunday before Platonics West this this last month is a is a perfect example of, you know, how commercially approachable this space is. Um, so so as the product manager at Gruchin Hasco and responsible for uh, imaging systems and and optical systems in particular, uh, and and talking to you know our you know, our drive toward commercialization and, and you know, productization of, of component parts here, you know, we're particularly, uh, we're particularly excited about, um, you know, a development that we're calling our Apollo series, which are, you know, uh, imaging, imaging objectives corrected for the V-near, but leveraging historical expertise with respect to, you know, delivering s imaging systems on a built to specification basis to the Lockheeds and the North of Grumman's and the, the ball aerospaces of the world to say, well, what if we looked at this and started to make a commercial offering that utilizes these features and, and, and lends themselves well, because in imaging space, I'm sure a lot of our payload integrators are aware that a lot of the, a lot of the commercial off the shelf products currently they're not built in a way that will, you know, that lends themselves to the sort of environments that 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 you'll realize in space, the vacuum, the radiation, and the and the temperature swings. So, you know, I, I think this is a particularly exciting development for the group. And then the other, you know, not just the uh, the visible through the near IR, but but leveraging our experience historically for, you know, we we do imaging systems for the short wave and the mid wave and the long wave, and in this space of productization and commercialization. We're also looking at you know, a, a set of off the shelf space qualified long wave uh, imaging objectives for you know, some of the very large format bolometers that are coming to market. Um, so those are those are I think the most exciting developments for uh, Gucci and Housco, at least the optical systems group here in Keene, New Hampshire. Thank you very much, JJ. And you can't imagine how important it is for us to have Gucci and Costco in Optica. Remember, if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is reply the thank you email that you will get, and we will make the introduction for you to follow up. Uh, JJ expects many introductions, but I want to uh, give more information to Lucas and to help you continue ramping up. Lucas, there is another company in the room, and that's coming all the way from beautiful, beautiful Netherlands. So it's a global company. The company is Dencon. Mark. Beautiful, beautiful Netherlands, indeed. <laughs> goeie middag, bijna goeie avond. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so uh, um, let me uh, put up uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, let me see. I hope this works, right? Not there yet. we go. Yeah, looking good. Yeah, it's here. Yes, go ahead. Good, thank you. So thanks uh, for the opportunity uh, to present this slide, uh, Jose. So uh, my name is Mark van Dijk, uh, as you already uh, introduced me. Uh, I'm responsible for the business development uh, at Demcon Focal, uh, the optomechatronics uh, company of Demcon. Uh, yeah, for those who do not know uh, who Demcon is, we are a, a Dutch-based contract design and engineering house for optomechatronic systems. Uh, um, so uh, today... Um, I would like to give a brief overview of. Oh, I hear a phone ringing here. Sorry, was a bit distracted. Not mine. Uh, so I want to uh, give a brief overview of the optical communications and sensing applications uh, for space uh, that we are uh, working on. Uh, it's probably uh, not new to you, but uh, to introduce a bit of the challenges. Uh, uh, when a satellite uh, communicates uh, to another satellite or to a ground uh, station on Earth or so, uh, you have to cover serious uh, long distances and then uh, all kinds of different disturbances uh, that may cause that the signal that you want to transmit uh, yeah, that becomes corrupted uh, or even uh, misses the receiving uh, device uh, at all. So to overcome this... Um, uh, you can imagine all kinds of optical and electronic systems are implemented in between the sensor and the receiver. So we heard that already, I think, from DLR and uh, I think uh, Roger uh, of the ESA also mentioned this already and some others. Uh, so uh, when you do this right, then you have the capability of really 
good aiming or uh, wavefront uh, correcting uh, capabilities, uh, you can overcome uh, these issues and you can build a system that can indeed transmit data fast over very long distances. So that's why uh, we worked uh, uh, on the FSM. You can see that, uh, uh, which stands for a fine steering mirror, obviously. So uh, you can use this uh, device to, uh, which is uh, well space graded, um, to aim uh, with a bandwidth of one kilohertz, uh, very accurately a laser beam from a satellite to a ground station. So. Um, uh, from the beginning of 2023, uh, this uh, device was actually uh, well uh, implemented in a CubeSat and uh, was shot into uh, space by, I believe, a SpaceX uh, rocket uh, and is now uh, traveling in orbit over, uh, well, I believe 500 kil kilometers high altitude. Uh, which was, of course, a success in itself, but uh, it even becomes better for us. Uh, last month, uh, I believe the consortium, uh, which was uh, well a joint venture uh, led by TNO, uh, a, a Dutch um, research institute, which we worked uh, closely together with, uh, they reported uh, that this um, this uh, uh, CubeSat uh, uh, really sent data towards Earth. So that's that's what the what what the article is about here. And uh, the, the picture uh, on the bottom right, you see this red dot here uh, where the finger is pointing towards. This is really the light that is uh, coming uh, from the laser. So you have to imagine that this cube shot is traveling uh, at 500 kilometers alt altitude with approximately 24,000 kilometers an hour. And it's still uh, locked onto the ground station. I believe it was in uh, Tenerife, if I'm correctly. Yeah, and it was able to uh, um, uh, send and transmit data uh, with almost one gigabit uh, per second. So um, that was a success. It gave us some really space heritage for the first time. Uh, a, a one of our systems uh, is in space, so that's good, and it worked. Uh, so, uh, but to achieve even higher. Um, uh, transfer data transfer rates. We were also working, if you'll allow me uh, a few minutes more, uh, we were also working on the um, uh, uh, wavefront uh, sensor. So that's on the, the the top right. There's an image of the uh, of the wavefront sensor that we built together with uh, TNO uh, as well. Uh, and our part in this was to build uh, the the sensor and the um, the the lenslet. Um, array in front of it and uh, the algorithm behind it to allow five kilohertz bandwidth uh, away from de decomposition. Mark, so, have a that's... question coming on the way from New York. And I need to interrupt here because ah, that question go. really is going to yes. be very helpful for your pitch. Let's go to New York. Let's go to PLX. Mark, can you tell us what's in your mind? Yeah, I was just curious about what sort of accuracy and resolution performance you're getting from your fine steering mirror. Ah, so the resolution is, uh, I can uh, look that up, uh, maybe. Um, I think my screen is still sharing, right? Yep. So uh, I believe the um, the the resolution is in uh, a few um, micro radians, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, it's, uh, it's a resolution of two micro radians. Um, and uh, it can it allows for plus minus uh, one degree of uh, tip tilt, uh, and uh, which is two degrees uh, optical. Um, okay, that's, uh, I hope that uh, answers your uh, yeah, question does, a bit. You. Yep. Yes, Good. Malcolm, I hope you found this meeting very useful. We know you have many potential suppliers, customers, and partners in the room. Thank you very much for your support. And then come, stay tuned, because you provide metrology to companies like the next one. And let's go all the way to the capital of optics in Europe. Let's go to Jena, and let's meet Sebastian Henkel from Aspherico. Tell us how we can use freeform aspherical optics in space and what you can do for the others. The floor is yours. Send us away. This is the last presentation of today. Send us away the way that we all deserve. Oh, thank you, Jose. Thanks, Optica, for having me uh, tonight. So, um, Aspherikon, um, as uh, 
space solutions provider I would like to introduce to do it today. Uh, we are obviously um, a manufacturer of, as we carry it in our name, uh, of S-spheres, but what we can also do, as Jose just mentioned, uh, freeforms and any other kind of optics uh, you're looking for, also in very demanding uh, materials, uh, basically all the wavelengths. And of course, uh, along with this comes uh, high and finishing um, process uh, we have established within the company here, uh, not only the MRF technology, but also some proprietary uh, technologies we usually use for space optics. And of course, uh, uh, in the end, uh, you also want to have it coded. So we provide from UV up to the mid IR range, um, different techniques we uh, have here in the company, um, spotter technology, especially for uh, high reflective coatings um, used in uh, uh, space application, but any basically on aerospace uh, applications in general. And of course we can also test them. Um, we have all the test cap capabilities in-house here in Jena. Um, along with this uh, comes a big service package. So um, as some of you might know, we are the digital first manufacturer. So all the entire process chain, the entire, entire value chain um, is 100% traceable uh, here within the company. Uh, we carry all the data here in-house. So no, no external cloud uh, providers are uh, used. Uh, so that's in compliance with ISO. That's we are uh, what we get asked from our customers. So where is the data saved? So it's everything in-house, physically uh, divided um, servers. Um, and of course, uh, this enables us to start at the very beginning, uh, given all the nice data we have, um, not only to manufacture it, but uh, to give you also the um, full package in terms of um, design, um, consultancies and stuff like that. Um, some references, and I just put a few names here on the missions. Uh, we, we have been part of it so far, or still part of it. Uh, the Sentinel programs, uh, some other stuff here uh, where we have provided uh, mirrors and spacers uh, for SRXP program, for instance, and also in terms of um, uh, positioning sensors, we provided optics uh, to, to a company in Scandinavia. And we heard a lot about of uh, miniaturization today uh, in terms of monolithic designs, in terms of uh, prisms. I would also like to introduce, uh, <clears throat> just to represent uh, the capabilities, I would also like to show you this kind of, uh, yeah, sugar cube sized uh, little guy here. So it's a very tiny element. Uh, I think this could be of interest uh, for, for most of you uh, to have them incorporated into your um, optical systems. And um, as introduced earlier, how, how, can we, how can we do that and how can we really achieve um, such nice um, yeah, values and um, give you a very quick idea of um, how scalable a product is in terms of the optics is because our um, core competence from the very beginning is our, as we call it, our intelligent software, which was basically invented about 22 years ago. Even the buzzword industry 4.0 wasn't invented yet, and we are living it for 22 years now. Uh, basically, trace the entire chain of value of our um, customer inquiries uh, through the qualification phase, uh, sending all the data into the machines, have them manufactured, have them coded uh, through the integration until it will be uh, put in a parcel and will be sent back to you. Um, and uh, this is also in compliance with our um, uh, Dean ISO 10110 uh, in terms of the drawings and everything. All the data is sent directly to the machines and can be pulled out of the database at any time from day one, lens one, zero and number one. Just to give you an example, uh, if you would come up and say, tell me about lens X, Y, Z, what was, what was the measurement data there? Uh, who has worked on the lens? Uh, can you send me the measurement data again? Because I need to have it. I need to import it into my system. Uh, we can do it anytime. That's just- Thank you very uh, much, Sebastian. I believe uh, that the concept is clear. I would like, uh, if you allow me to go back to, to go back to Lucas now from Orotech. Yeah. Lucas, you yeah. heard 
Uh, the pitch from from Wuchan House School, which you, you also heard from Aspherikon, from Dencom, from many others today. Can you close the meeting with one challenge from your side that we could all try to address after the meeting with an introduction to you? I think like one one challenge also that is challenging for us is um, covering a wide spectral range of of. Uh, of thermal infrared. So we are working from midwave infrared to long wave infrared, and that's uh, very, very, so very uh, seldom to see on the market. So especially integrated systems are not available. That's why we needed to develop themselves. So therefore, this is a, a big challenge, and I would be happy to see uh, some solutions coming up here. Uh, I hear you, or we hear you. So that's definitely something uh, uh, we, we, we see in the market. We are working on that. Um, as of yet, as I just told you, up to mid-wave infrared, but uh, we are heavily working on extending it to, to the long-wave infrared range, for sure. If you can address that challenge, you should get in touch with Lucas from Aurora Tech. It has been a great meeting, yeah. two hours and exactly seven minutes. Please um, accept my apologies for those extra seven minutes of your time. I will compensate it by buying you a beer next time I see you. I mean it. I will not claim the expense. I will buy all of you a beer for this seven minutes. Great. Remember, if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, you will receive now a thank you email for registering for this event. Reply that thank you email with the person that you want to get in touch with and ask. The Optican team will personally make the introduction. Because it's for a living. But this company is doing so Thank you for making us happy. Thank you for being part of Optica. Bye bye. All right. So, uh,